Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Seed Innovation to Deliver Farmer Prosperity. Select experts weigh in. Before we get to the experts, I'm Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and I'm going to orient you to the BlueJeans platform. <clears throat> on the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the bottom right and indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered, and you can ask questions throughout this event. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Rob Bertram. Thank you, Michael, and greetings, everyone. Um, I always love these events because I know we have a global audience. And um, grateful also to uh, AgriLinks uh, for, um, for the recording of this. So I hope if, if you enjoy it, you feel free to share it with your the link with colleagues who might be interested. So we're going to focus on a, a very uh, important topic today. And it's, it's not a new one for AgriLinks, but it's one that is of continuing importance that we keep in mind and we keep seeking to up our game. And um, it's all, all about seed and how seed gets into the hands of farmers and into their fields in ways that uh, really create gains. And I think just to briefly remind us that seed is an area where it's always been important. With climate change, it's more important than ever. That's not just about abiotic stress, things like heat or drought, which very importantly, are being worked on by scientists and farmers are already benefiting from many of those innovations through seed, but also biotic stresses. Uh, we know that pests and diseases are moving in places they haven't been before, in part due to climate. Think of the outbreaks of, say, wheat blast in, in, in Bangladesh and, and, and things like that. So there's many examples. Um, so. The challenge, of course, is particularly acute in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we know that the average age of a maize hybrid, for example, is somewhere between 10 and 20 years. I just was in a field in Burundi where it was 30 years, uh, and in the United States or Europe or Canada, other areas of the world, we know that farmers are turning over varieties three to five, six years. And, and this is uh, in maize, of course, but not just in maize, in, other, in, in many uh, self-pollinated crops as well, they're moving much more rapidly. And uh, with climate change, there's, as I said, really important reasons to do that. Um, I think the other challenge we have in Africa when we think about seed, we also, you know, we talk a lot about soils and soil fertility and soil health. And uh, we know fertilizer use is much lower in Africa than in the rest of the world. That's as much a symptom as a cause of low yields. And, and we are investing also in ways to improve soil health. And what, is, what happens if we do that? Seeds do better. So these two key areas of driving basic productivity on farm, the genetics, the quality seed, it's not just the genetics, it's the quality of the seed that's delivered. And in a, in a, in a soil and agronomic setting, that is going to allow that seed to achieve its potential. Um, so this is a, a job, really job number one in many ways, and, and many of our missions are doubling down on this. Um, we, um, we know that public investment remains very important, and we've done a lot of work. Uh, my colleague, Mark Heisinger, might be on the line today, but uh, Mark has worked for years with colleagues that show, to do work that show the combination of the public and private sectors being important in different ways for different crops. We've also worked hard at USAID with our missions and our and a, both bilateral and regional missions 
and many uh, partners on the policy side in countries and at the regional level to harmonize uh, seed rules around certification, seed trade, in ways that incentivize investment and also uh, accelerate the rate at which farmers can actually access new varieties because of fewer hurdles to jump country by country. And this is particularly important in Africa. We have a lot of countries that with similar agroecologies where farmers can benefit across, say, a whole farming system. So in many cases now, one country will recognize a variety approved in another. Um, so again, just a last reminder before we finish up here, why is getting seed and fertilizer for soil fertility and health, uh, soil health and agronomy right? Because uh, the uh, what we've seen in the past two decades in Africa is that three fourths of the growth came from extensification. That is just farming more land. That is neither poverty reducing, nor is it environmentally sustainable. And especially when we think about contexts where there's woodlands or forests or hills, uh, hillsides and such that are, are fragile environments and are also very important for biodiversity of all kinds and for environmental services. So in the agriculture sector, farm sector, we need to do our job to uh, enable farmers to get more from less, less land, maybe less water, less fertilizer, even by virtue of greater fertilizer use efficiency, water use efficiency, et cetera. So um, we have many partners in this, our missions, our the uh, innovation labs, CGIR, AGRA, uh, and of course, all kinds of last mile partners and, and, and other uh, uh, donor partners in regional and uh, international actors. And of course, most importantly, the countries, our partner countries themselves. So today we are joined by David Wayanainu, Aggie Conde, and Tony Gatungu. Uh, I'm going to introduce all three of them now, and then I'll then we'll hand it over first to David. David Wayanaina is program manager for Context Global Development and has 18 years of experience working across many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. He is passionate about improving the livelihoods of smallholder farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa by managing the processes that help them access innovative products or technology. So that really says it all, and you can see greater detail about David here. Welcome, David. And next, Aggie Conde is Vice President at Pro for Program Innovation and Delivery at the uh, a Green Rev Alliance for a Green Revolution in Agra, or a Green Revolution for Agra, Africa, Agra. Under her leadership, a multidisciplinary team at Musingi East Africa Scope designed and implemented multiple interventions across two growth industries, aquaculture, textiles, and apparel, creating over 800 jobs and crowding in others and con convening further interventions from multiple private and public sector actors. So we're so lucky to have Aggie with that background, bring it into the space that we're in here. Welcome, Aggie, great to see you. And last speaker is Tony Gatungu. Tony is global head of Seeds to Be for the Sujeta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture based in Nairobi, Kenya. Seeds to Be is the uh, Sujeta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture seed stream that helps farmers access quality, affordable seeds of improved varieties for the crops they need. Tony leads the strategy and long-term planning for seeds to be in Africa and Asia. So as you see, there's more complete biographies shown here. It's really wonderful to have these three great speakers all coming to us from Africa and uh, where our work is concentrated. And I'm with that, I turn it over to you, David. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. And on behalf of my colleagues from CJD, we thank you very much for this opportunity. And my topic for today is, uh, is seed marketing important? This is a, this is a topic that, we, that is very close to our heart. We can't claim to be ex, very good experts in it, but uh, we will make, uh, uh, we will uh, brief uh, on what we think that uh, the audience needs to know here. Yeah, slide two. Yeah, so the, the themes that I'm going to be covering today is what you see on the screen, what is seed marketing, and why is the function so important? 
what are the ca current capability gaps and where do seed companies uh, fall short and what can they do better? Next slide. So uh, the topic for today is of course um, seed marketing, but uh, for the audience here that may not be marketing experts, I'll try to, 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 to define it in a way that, uh, that is simple to understand. So as you can see on the screen, it's marketing is a strategy you use for getting your ideal target prospect to know you, like you, trust you, enough to become a customer. Here the keyword is ideal target because in marketing you cannot be everything to every, everything to everyone. So the, the, the keyword here ideal target is a theme that I'm going to keep bringing. Yeah, so what is marketing? So you, a lot of us confuse marketing with uh, advertising, promotion, publicity, PR, sales, and marketing. So these are terms that are in, in interchangeably used. But I'll try to simplify it here by giving an example. So for example, you're organizing a circus in town and uh, you put a sign that circus is coming to the showground on Saturday. That is advertising because basically you're giving information. And if you put the sign on the back of an elephant and have it walk through into town, that's promotion because what, what you will be doing is not every day we see elephants in town, but you are going to be attracting. You're going to attract the, 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 the attention of the people to, to read your message. And if this elephant walks through the mayor's flower bed, it's not a very nice thing to do. And the local newspapers write about it, that is publicity because now you've caught the attention of, 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 of the mayor. If the mayor gets to laugh about it, and the newspapers have written about this, that's public relations, because now this is about image. So in marketing, there's, uh, the, the, the PR is also very important because it has to do with the, with, the, with the image. And further to that, if the town citizens go to the circus, you show them that many entertainment booths, and you explain to them that they're going to have fun by spending money at the booths, you answer their questions, and ultimately they spend uh, a lot, a lot of money in the circus, that is sales. So, because you've got them to take action. And if this whole thing was, was planned, that is what you call marketing. So basically it's planning your advertising, your promotion, your public, uh, your publicity, and your public relations and sales. So that is what, that is actually marketing. Slide four, please. So, so what is seed marketing and why is it so important? So seed marketing is getting farmers to perceive the value of your product that, and that this, they, they should perceive that the value of the products you're proposing meets their needs and you motivate them to purchase and plant them. And so here we are talking of specific farmers. So because it's not all farmers that you can meet their needs. So you choose, you choose the segment of the farmers that you, you, you want to serve you get them to perceive the value of your product and they feel that you're going to meet their, their needs and they purchase your seeds and, and plant them. We know all uh, breeding programs exist uh, only to provide high quality seed for, for marketing. So why is it important? Uh, seed marketing is important because uh, like the, the points are on, on the screen here. Uh, they ensure improved varietal adoption and turnover. And here when we say turnover, we mean the replacement of new, uh, new varieties replacing the old ones. That's what we call turnover. And what, what this does is that it helps national yields to go up, farmers' livelihoods are improved, food security is enhanced, and seed marketing also contributes to the sustainable development goal number two, to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So when seed marketing is successfully uh, implemented, farmer prosperity is, is almost guaranteed. Today's, today's uh, webinar is about uh, farmer prosperity. So seed marketing is, is very much uh, important when we are talking of uh, uh, guaranteeing food secu uh, farmer prosperity. And in the African context, food security is also greatly uh, correlated with the peace. We've seen that countries that are able to feed their population are generally much quite peaceful than the other countries. So you can see seed marketing is, is very important, not just for, for the farmer, but for the nation. Slide five, please. Slide five, yeah. So um, 
talking of seed marketing and why it's important, it, it's not just enough to talk uh, of the importance of seed marketing, but I would also like to highlight what the capabilities for uh, seed marketing, a good, a good demand creator uh, sh should be. So the, what you see on the screen is the, the capabilities that we believe uh, form what good seed marketing is. So in the customer insight, here we are trying to ask ourselves, what are, who are those specific farmers that we can serve? And what are their specific pain points? Yeah, because you, if we identify the pain points of the specific farmers we are trying to to solve to serve, then we will be able to do uh, to, to serve them better. For example, uh, if we look at Eastern Africa, what is really happening? Climate change is becoming a big issue. So all farmers here are facing uh, drought. Uh, issues of uh, water. So it's very important for seed marketers to actually get close to them, understand what their, their challenges are, and these varieties that they should be breeding to be addressing this issue. The other, the other uh, advantage of knowing what your specific farmers are looking for is that you're able to breed for them. For example, if uh, your farmers are producing for the other countries or for other geographies, then you need to know that you will be coming up with varieties that can can, can actually travel, can withstand the transport challenges. And you only get to know this if you're very close to the farmer, getting to know what they, they are looking for. So customer insight uh, gathering should be continuous because farmers make decisions several times in the life of their crop. Decision points are throughout the, the farming. So the, the seed marketers should actually almost live with the farmers. And the cycle for, for, for me, it's, it's farmer, breeder, farmer. It, it, we mostly think it's a breeder to farmer, but it should be farmer, breeder to farmer, because that is what completes the loop. Now, product positioning, this is where we, we talk of the value that we are proposing to the farmer. So again, going back to the pain points they are having, for example, in East Africa with the drought situation, uh, the products that we should be proposing to them are the ones that, uh, so the, the features and benefits that we are proposing to them, do they address these specific uh, challenges that they are fa facing. So that is what you call the product positioning, how your features give them benefits. The other capability is on um, MARCOM, Marketing and Communication Strategy. So this is where you ask yourself, what are the most effective ways of connecting with a targeted prospect? Here we talk of branding, pricing, promotion, creative uh, development. So again, the goal here is how you get the farmer's care of mind and heart, because that's the only way they are going to get uh, attracted to your variety. That's the only way that they will take action. That's the only way they are going to take up these newer varieties. So, and this is the only way that we're going to, to see uh, new variety adoption and turnover. So commercial, what is commercial execution? So it, it's, it's one of the capab important capabilities be before you again go back to customer insight. So here, you ask yourself, how do we fulfill our business objectives through actions in the field? Talk of uh, uh, after-sales services, uh, sales channel training, territory planning, village level engagement. Uh, and here you, you, you also you look at how do you use champion farmers? The farmers who have adopted your varieties quite early should become your uh, champions because we, we know farmers, they, they, they tend to trust other farmers more than they try, trust the seed marketers. So if seed marketers are able to win champion farmers and have, having addressed their needs, then seed marketing becomes a, a strong capability because then you get farmer test, uh, testimonials. After knowing what the capabilities are, so one of the other themes that uh, I have to address is how are the companies doing and what are the gaps? Next slide, please. So in answering this question, CGD did a, a, a market research across Africa in the East, Central and uh, West Africa. And we interviewed uh, several com uh, companies, mid-sized companies, and we had responses from executives, uh, 23 executives from notable SME companies who participated in the questions that were around ma these marketing capabilities on two things what they thought were very important and how they thought they were performing. So I'm, I'm happy to present to you some of the, the findings that we had in the, in the next slide, please. 
Yeah, so on the capabilities that I've just presented, you, you can see that the first, the, the, the top line is how, what the executives thought was very important in seed marketing as capabilities. And the, the line below is how they thought they were doing. So you can already see that uh, uh, it's, it's common knowledge, even among the seed marketers, that there is a gap in, uh, in the marketing capabilities. And generally the scores were larger around uh, customer insight and commercial executive, exec, execution capabilities. So of course, if the gaps were more on the customer insights and we, we as seed marketers are supposed to know what the farmer wants, it's likely then that we are proposing to farmers what does not meet their needs. And what is happening is that with, without a clear insight, without a clear understanding of what the farmer really needs and the advantage that we need to be proposing to them, most market, most new market introductions are likely to fail. And that's what we've seen that even public varieties, private sector varieties, good varieties or in, in the eyes of the companies or the breeders, but in the eyes of the farmer, these are not, these are not what the farmers are looking for. So a lot of business decisions by, by investors, public institutions, or even donors are based on uh, uh, wrong business decisions. And therefore the return on investment has been low. And that's th those are some of the topics that we need to be discussing today. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's an expanded view of, uh, of our findings. You can see actually uh, there was gaps ev everywhere in all the capabilities. Uh, seed marketers do agree that they are, they are, they are, not, uh, they are not meeting the capabilities that are, that are required. Next slide. Yeah, so what needs to be addressed? Uh, I think we can say by looking at the gaps, uh, the stakeholders can actually look at the, the key gaps where they're they are, they are falling short and look at the strengths that they have and make the improvements in that specific area. However, uh, what, what we can say is that investing more in cu more customer insight would lead to more diversification, adoption, and turnover because we are meeting the customer needs. So here, seed marketers need to be, be very close with the farmer, understand what the farmers are, and it's throughout, it's not a one-time event. It's, it's basically the field people who are supposed to be uh, getting the parts of the farmer so that then uh, uh, the, this gap is, is reduced. When we talk of more robust promotion strategy, we are talking of tactics to increase uh, product knowledge, visibility, advice on crop management, demand and adoption. And these are demonstration plots, yield contest, field days. So all that is promotion. It gets the attention of the farmers. We need to talk to invest more on uh, on-farm product testing, because this is the only way you get to know that you're addressing the farmer pain point. It's, it's not the testing at the research station, but it should be actually on the farm. That way the, the farmers are able to see what uh, whether this variety is going to give them value. When we talk of uh, commercial execution strategy, it's at the village level engagement, channel and staff training. These are very important uh, links to the farmer. And we all know that when the, the channel, the staff, the field staff are well trained, they are the ones who live with the farmer and they actually are able to, 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 to present the value that we are proposing to the farmer. The other one is on the data usage. Uh, data is, uh, is very important. And uh, what we've seen is that there are new companies coming up that are able to generate data. And this is something that com companies can adopt to, to improve uh, this commercial execution. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the best practices that we've seen in the market for companies that uh, tend to do well is the investment in marketing. And uh, we have to also look at how much, for example, is the public sector or the donors investing in, in marketing. So much investment goes into R&D, but not so much goes in marketing. Yet, when we look at the best practices, you can see the investment by good marketers, it's at the ratio of one to one or even double or even more. And no wonder then these varieties of these companies are able to reach farmers uh, much quicker. So next slide, please. I'm almost coming to the end of the presentation. So the question is, what are we doing about this, uh, about this uh, to, to help feed marketers? So we are coming, we are, we are undertaking uh, a market research 
and we will be looking at four uh, marketing innovations on how, and we will be generating evidence on how this influence farmers to uptake new varieties. So we'll be looking at varietal information to support purchasing decisions by farmers. We'll be looking at social marketing and basically how does it influence new farmers. Varietal information is basically sharing the, 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 the information that breeders have come up with to the farmer and see, does it have an impact? Just sharing the information. Social marketing is a general uh, ad advertisement. For example, newer is better, getting them to, to know that they are newer seeds and how does it influence. Point of sale is the interventions at the agri level. So we will also be researching that. And the final one is digital marketing, SMS, WhatsApp, Instagram. How does it influence the farmers? So we will be doing this research and we will be coming back to you in, in a while. Next slide, please. Yes, that's the last, last slide. And we, through the research that we shall be doing, we are looking at the risk in marketing invest, investments so that marketing managers can, can at least be sure of where to invest. And we, we are hoping that we'll be able to answer these hard questions and we will be back to you. So we ask you to, to stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And once again, it's just so gratifying to see the work that Context has done, continues to do, to help uh, move this whole sector forward. Very illuminating. Well, I'm going to turn it now to our next speaker, Aggie Conde at Agra. Over to you, Aggie. Thank you very much, Rob. I hope uh, you can all hear me loud and clear. Excited to be joining you uh, on this call. Thank you very much, ESAID and AgriLinks, for putting this together and really excited to see that the opening presentation is by a marketer, because as a fellow myself, that's exciting uh, area for discussion for me. So my presentation, I will actually now be going to the demand side, because I think David was speaking about the pool side of the market and what really needs to be done. Um, but if you go to the next slide, I think, Demand for what? Um, so I thought that I would intro this slide with just a quick introduction on what the role, what Agra is focusing on on the road to 2030. Inclusive agriculture transformation basically means that uh, we are set up to contribute to zero hunger in the countries where we operate, to improved nutrition. We're set up to also support the end of poverty while at the same time addressing climate adaptation. So those are the big ticket things that as AGRA we are setting ourselves up to contribute to and as a result we believe that we should be able to have inclusive agriculture transformation. And what this means is that you will not, you will not leave anyone behind and as the economies grow, you're having the whole population at least able to afford one meal a day and one nutritious meal a day, while at the same time protecting the environment in which we operate. So I think that's basically the, the boundaries within which we operate. And to achieve that, there are three buckets that we focus on. Of course, the first and foremost one is to empower and build resilience. As you probably all know, we support smallholder farmers. And to David's presentation, empowerment means you're giving smallholder farmers the choice. And with marketing, what that then means is that you're giving varieties, you're increasing choice for farmers. Then they make a decision whether they want to go for an improved seed or not. And when that happens, we then believe that with markets which are pooling based on the, on the marketing that David has spoken about, then they should be able to get a good price at the right time and then be able to increase the, better their livelihood. And all of that cannot happen, of course, without a capable state. And therefore, those are the three pillars in which AGRA operates. And to do that, our ambition is to reach at least 25 million smallholder farmers and we will be working across 15 countries directly, but that doesn't mean that's where we stop because if our models are tested and proven, they can always cross beyond the 15 countries in which we are. And that then increases adoption 
and practices using a public-private sector partnership model. So for the next slide, I wanted to, you know, uh, take the audience a bit back uh, to try and understand why the role of seed is critical. Um, let me put the first caveat. Seed is not the only, it's not a magic word. It is one of many, first and foremost. But what we have learned from other economies that have revolutionized through agriculture is that if you've got a functional and efficient seed system, you're able to take at least a 20 to 30 percent improvement in productivity. And that then can translate into yield. So if you look at the numbers that David was sharing, the adoption of that seed is sitting way below 20 percent. And that means that the majority of smallholder farmers are actually using non-improved varieties, right? So where we are currently sitting with all the shocks that we are continuing to experience, with the Russia-Ukraine being the most, the most recent that we all can relate with, is that the long value chains that we were operating in have reminded us of the urgency to actually now shorten these value chains. What does that mean? It means that we must be able to produce our seed locally. It means that we must be able to have all our inputs locally. It therefore means we must have a vibrant private public sector that allows businesses to thrive while at the same time increasing access for seed at the right time, in the right quantities, at the right price, and obviously with variety. So uh, that then said, um, the other beauty that we are seeing, which we're actually now calling kind of like a magic word, with climate change, we are now very sure that some seed varieties can actually respond to the malnutrition challenge and the climate change challenge. What do we mean by that? If you look at mal the malnutrition numbers that are sitting way above 20% in most countries, they are seed varieties that offer pro-vitamin A, for example, in maize. We are seeing iron-rich beans. We are seeing vitamin A in cassava, in rice, in potatoes. So all of these are crops that we eat on a normal, we used to eat when I was growing up, but they're no longer, you know, you know, widely consumed in homesteads nowadays. But these are direct solutions to malnutrition, number one. But two, some of what we are calling either the forgotten crops or whatever, like sorghum and millet, are ready, they can be able to, uh, to take the heat that we are having with the climate change issues. So seed, therefore, plays a very, very key role, not just in the immediate past, but also in the immediate present, in that it is resilient and can be able to absorb the current shocks we're seeing. So next slide. So moving on, um, now I wanted to just give you a quick sneak peek into the state of play of the seed sector in the last, ten, in the last decade. Um, as Agra, through the support of USAID and other donors, we have been in the seed sector, I think we call it our most mature body of work at Agra. And what has that done? Uh, in the peak of marketing, I could call it, if you use Porter's model, we have actually seen the liberalization of the seed sector in all the countries that we operate. And what that means is that government is letting go of managing or micromanaging the sector and allowing seed companies to come in. And why is that important? That is important because government generally is not an enterprise. It doesn't do well doing business. The so government's core role in most of the transformation journeys we've seen is to really regulate, to regulate the sector, to ensure it puts in the right policies, because you can't be the judge and the jury in most of these cases. You must be able to play a core role. And therefore, you know, in as recent as, as uh, countries like Malawi, and I think we're still having a few challenges in countries like Mozambique, but we're seeing broadly governments letting go of the seed sector and allowing other actors to come in play, which is increasing choice for the farmers. So if you remember, the more choice the farmer has, the more the prices come down, the quality improves, sector becomes competitive, and therefore, you know, it becomes cheaper for the smallholder farmer. And therefore, we've also seen barriers of entry lowered. What do I mean? In the most recent past, we used to only have multinationals operating in this sector. 
Right now, we are proud to say as, as Agra, with the support of our donors, that we've supported over 110 seed company, local seed companies. Yes, they have gotten challenges along the way, but we've seen a majority of them grow to actually become even regional players. We are seeing most of them, you know, like in Tanzania and, 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 uh, and Ghana and Nigeria, become second players, third players in terms of market share command. So this is very good because then you're building capacities in country, you're nuancing the seed in, to address the challenges that are specific to the local areas in which we operate. And it therefore means that we are not handing over our seed, uh, our, our seed integrity to foreign companies. So if we're having shocks like we had with COVID, you're very sure that you can be able to produce your seed in the region and locally. And what that has then done is that it has, of course, increased seed production. As you will see in some of the numbers that will follow, it has also improved access to quality seed. It has reduced uh, counterfeit seed. We've seen in some countries like Nigeria, counterfeit seed reducing by as much as 34%, 34%, meaning the farmer is able to get a quality seed, which wasn't the case in the past. And then obviously the, what we call speed to market in terms of from the development of the variety to the release has also shortened. And that is really what you would like to see in new product development processes. And of course that comes with good regulation where we are beginning to also see for the first time seed crossing borders with very clear regulations. And again, that is the first that we are only seeing in the last uh, two to three years. From a policy front, um, I must say one of the things that we are super proud uh, of contributing to is um, obviously uh, early generation seed production, which has increased significantly, uh, both in terms of quality and quantity and capacity. It still has challenges, but we, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, Rome was never built in overnight. And the other most important one is actually um, PPB, where we are able to now be able to uh, control, you know, the, the rights, the rights of that variety, and then you can be able to make sure that uh, the plant breeders' rights are respected, and uh, that allows actually seed companies to come into the market, you know, because then you're rewarding the innovators, you're rewarding the scientists to actually think ahead of the curve and address the challenges of the farmer. Next slide. All right, so just a quick um, agree in the most in the last year we we embarked on a journey to actually do a seed start assessment. We have actually done this for 11 countries now, and I will be walking you through uh, the next slide to show you what each of those parameters are. But what I would love to show you on this slide is really that none of the seed systems across the six countries is anywhere close to 80. If you look at the blue bar, probably the Kenya, Kenya has got some high numbers around quality assurance, but if you see NPC, which is national coordination, it is the lowest across. And the learnings that we have had is that if you don't solve for all of the, the sub-components of a system, it doesn't matter how well one score is one area will totally pull down the performance of the whole system. And what that then means, it means that you're disadvantaging the smallholder farmer, who in this case is actually the consumer of the seed system. But I'll show you what each of those abbreviations means in the next slide, because I have got, if you go to the next slide, I've got a good pictorial to just give you a sneak peek into Kenya. So the abbreviations you're seeing on the slide below, uh, this chart, pretty much shows you the weaknesses in each of the systems in Kenya. We've mapped about eight subsystems across, and the area that is the weakest link, they say we are as strong as our weakest link, is national planning and coordination. So what does this mean? You all know that Kenya is a devolved function. So if there is no national and county planning, then efforts in one county will be watered down by another. Even though you've got very good policies or you've got, you know, improving early generation seed, if you do not have very good scores in farmer awareness and perception, then everything really goes to, to waste. So this is why we are now taking a full systems approach as opposed to looking at just one bottleneck, because we believe that 
it is in solving the totality of the system that you get to have a functional system that then delivers the productivity that we are looking for and the livelihoods that we are looking for. Another quick example that I wanted to show us is around Ghana on the next slide. Also assessed across the same parameters, uh, but now in this case, Ghana, as you can see, its weakest link is more around also national planning, but also quality assurance. So what does that mean? Quality assurance means that you not you don't have you only have 40% guarantee that the quality of the seed that is going to the farmer can only be 40% pure. And that is why it is very important to make sure that the, the government has the role to regulate so that we are protecting the smallholder farmer from accessing poor quality seed. And the same can apply on each of these. So as Agra, we obviously do not um, support each of the components, but what we do is we work with other partners in the ecosystem to come and work with us in the geographies where we are, so that in totality we are offering a suite of services that addresses all the issues that can then help us build a functional seed system. So if we go to the next slide, I will then be able to uh, just quickly walk you through the opportunities. Um, as the presenter, the earlier presenter David did show, the seed market is still extremely virgin. I think we, we, we call it, uh, you know, in marketing that it is just really at the growth curve, pretty much on the product life cycle. And it's got lots of opportunities because just about 30% of seed in the best case is being adopted. And I'm talking about, you know, quality seed. So it means that 70% of smallholder farmers are still using their homegrown, their recycling seed, right? And that then resonates with where we are at with food security. Because if we were able to increase the uptick of quality seed, I did mention earlier that it already gives you a guaranteed 20 to 30% uplift in volume or productivity, then we shouldn't have a hungry country. Ideally, and of course we all know that, uh, you know, not all factors, you know, such as parables, right? So weak NAS, national, agriculture research institutions is still a challenge. We all know from the Cardiff mandate that countries are supposed to invest at least 1.5% of their national budgets into R&D. That is not happening. What we are seeing is about 0.2% on average. We're seeing some countries a little higher, but on average it is just 0. You know, under 0.5%. So what does that mean? We might not be having the right varieties. We might not be responding uh, very fast to, to, to risks, to pests, to all of these climatic shocks. And as you know, the, you know, the lead time from design to deployment is anywhere between six to 10 years. So if right now we now know climate change is here and it's going to take us 10 years, by the time we get the right variety to the market, it's just gonna be too late. We're all going to be hungry. So government regulation, in spite of the improvements, still lacks capacity. It lacks standardization across border, across geographies, and that remains an opportunity. But more importantly, data, evidence, we are not seeing decisions that are being driven by evidence, by hard data. It is emerging, it's beginning to come together, but it is still disaggregated. So we believe that there is power in pulling all of the public and private sector data in a way at least to serve the public good, because then you reduce the risk of making the wrong choices, you improve accuracy and precision of decision making, and you're investing your, your limited dollars in the most catalytic nodes of the value chain. And that, therefore, that remains an opportunity, but it also remains an area for, uh, you know, the audience to really share with us some ideas on how can this be improved. Uh, the other area is, of course, shortage in area generation seed. As you know, it requires capacity, it requires investment, it requires infrastructure, and that is still not happening. So, the addressable market is still guesstimated around 50%. I'm using the word guesstimated because our work is just a drop in the ocean. We are only serving about 1% of the total uh, addressable market in every country in which we operate, but we can be able to use those numbers to prorate and forecast what can happen. So seed purity, like I mentioned, you know, uh, earlier on is we are seeing, of course, still counterfeit seed happening and that 
needs to be addressed, and that should be addressed with regulation. Farmer adoption, and I think David did speak to the awareness component on what does the farmer need. Farmer awareness is just at 30%. And this is farmer awareness for not just seed, but farmer awareness on basic things like good agronomic practices, how to respond, when to plant, how to buy, when to buy, when to choose to buy, and when not to choose to buy, access to markets. All of these things come together. It's not one size fits all, and it's also not one bullet, uh, one magic word to this question. Therefore, investments are still limited. And you know, this is a sector that we believe should be able to attract more investments, but obviously the policies, the regulation, the addressable market all must come together. And lastly, uncoordinated seed investment. We tend to see a couple of investments happening that are not layering on what others are already doing, but this is a problem for all sectors. And you know, as Agra, we're trying to see how to set ourselves up to try and address this problem because we believe that one dollar plus one dollar should give us a value of about a hundred dollars if we are coordinated. The next slide please. So as, as then I move you've seen the opportunity so any of you um, entrepreneurs on the on the call if you're looking to invest in the seed sector I believe there is opportunity but obviously you must make sure that you are looking at the market right and that you're entering at a point where your ROI is, is good. So some of the interventions we have made over the years uh, have, have focused on trying to address the bottlenecks, obviously. So seed analysis is one area that uh, we have now come very strong. The charts I was showing you earlier for Kenya and Ghana are part of our effort to try and make sure we're not going in blindfolded. We want to have a laser focus to our approach. We want to support our the countries in which we work to also deploy their resources with a laser eye. And therefore, seed SAT is a tool that will be available. Uh, we are now finishing the last four countries, and we think that by the end of the year, we will have assessed all the 11 countries, and we should be able to share data that can give investors confidence on where to invest across any of those nodes that I showed you. Digitization is also an, a great opportunity for young entrepreneurs that are looking for entry points in agriculture. As I mentioned, counterfeit seed is a big issue and we need solutions around that. There's good efforts. In, as you know, we introduced, uh, we supported gov some governments like in Kenya and Nigeria around the scratch cards on seed packs, I think in Uganda as well. Um, and we are seeing great, great, uh, great returns on those investments. So those are models that can easily be scaled. Early generation seed, like I mentioned earlier, is still you know, a no-brainer. We require a lot of partnerships, both in public and, and private sector. And then policy reforms is a continuous process. You, you, cannot, you cannot say that you reform and you know, keep there. We have to evolve. We have to be able to listen to all the key stakeholders. We've got to be able to ensure that the policies are responding to farmer needs and it's not you know, a, an urban city setup. So we are, the reason why we are pushing for data and digitization is to make sure that the policymakers have visibility on what's happening at the farm level so that the policies are actually responding to a, to a pain point and they're you know, not uh, just uh, uplifted. Case in point that we are uh, again proud of, Malawi just recently, as you know, for the first time passed a seed law that was you know, a, lo a long time coming. Mozambique is still using seed acts. So we still have quite a bit, but uh, in some countries we are seeing great progress. Then lastly is farmer awareness. That continues to be a problem. As you all know, the ratios between our extension service to farmer is averaging about for every one extension officer, they are seeing about 7,500 farmers. That's crazy. Like you cannot be able to reach them adequately on time and respond to all the challenges they have. So that remains an area of opportunity. So as I draw to an end, I think I have two more slides. Uh, let's go to the next. I'll try and move super fast. I know there's still one more. Um, what, what does it take to build a thriving seed industry? I did mention, I think I've mentioned all of these and I don't need to repeat them. So regulation, farmer awareness, market as a pool factor, resilience. It cannot be monocropping. You know, the, the farmer must be able to absorb shock 
as and when it happens. And as we've learned, there are so many shocks that the farmer is receiving at the moment and the yields are still very low. So all of the issues around seed, around land management, around water, around soil, around, you know, all of those must be addressed. And that's why, you know, farming is a complex conversation and, you know, we must be able to keep that. Then, but capacity, capacity both at public sector and in private institutions. The local SMEs that are in this sector don't have the capacity to hire, you know, crop scientists, to, or to hire agronomists, to hire soil scientists. They don't. It's expensive. So we must be able to find different models where the skills can be transferred to the rural areas where this business is happening so that we can get our business models right. And ultimately, we need a competitive sector. With competition, you have innovations, you have technologies coming faster, you have prices coming down, you have regulations following growth of the sector. And obviously, as you know, we're in the agriculture sector, we should be able to see the agriculture pie expanding and therefore being able to be a food secure, a food nutritious, secure and resilient sector in agriculture. So I have one slide, I think, to go, one or two, hopefully. Um, next slide. Yeah, I think we can. Um, okay, so let me speak to this because George and Jen will, will, you know, slaughter me if I don't. So most recently, we we launched the Center of uh, Seed Excellence in Agra. And why did we launch this center? We launched it last year purely to address some of the bottlenecks that I have been speaking to, and the word the, the things in 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 bold are really to solve for that to say, let's have better coordination. All the actors in the ecosystem, from civil society, to seed companies, to regulators, to farmers, to researchers, to academia, everybody in the sector, how can we sit around the same table and have similar conversations and make sure we are tracking similar parameters and make sure we've got the narrative for Africa right? That is really what we're trying to solve for in sector coordination. But that comes with evidence. And evidence does not necessarily mean that it's only evidence from AGRA. We're using public sector data. We're using community data. We're using all of the actors come will come with data. So we can be able to make an informed decision and advise stakeholders or policymakers or investors from the same book. We want to sing from the same hymn book. And then obviously that will then trigger R&D which will then make sure that business development services are affordable and ensure that the capacities that we need as a continent are resonating to the opportunity that we have so that we stop seeing headlines whereby Africa has the largest land, Africa can feed itself, but it's not. You know, we must be able to do that. Yeah, I can see you, Rob, come on. So <laughs> my, my, my last slide, which is the final, oh. final, I just want to show you that and I don't have to speak to it. Currently, smallholder farmers are only producing an average of 1.5 metric tons. The next slide. The target is to move them to three metric tons. If we got there, any shock that comes to the farmer, whether it's a weed, insect, drought, will not bring them down to below uh, poverty level, which is one metric ton. So all of us should be having one message, see how to do that, intensification, not expansion. Thank you very much, Rob. I will close so, there. Maggie, My terrific presentation. I'm going to be quick, but a lot of people, I think, are going to be interested in your slides. They're just fabulous. And but but you you both done a great job. But I, I need to turn it now to Tony Gatongu, our third speaker. Thank you. And then we'll have a discussion when Tony is done. Over to you, Tony. Thank you, Rob, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I'm going to be covering the um, same topic about scaling of seed innovation, uh, but I'm going to be walking you through our approach, which is the uh, seeds to be approach. Uh, so let's get started with the next slide, please. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about the Syngenta Foundation, just a quick snapshot of what we do. Uh, we're all about um, uh, developing or you know, having a brighter future for smaller farmers. We work in about 20 countries globally. And in order for us to, you know, achieve our vision, we have various streams of work. Um, one of them being uh, what we call agri-services. And uh, this is more or less around building agri-entrepreneurs to help um, scale out uh, the adoption of agri-innovations at the village level. 
We also have Agri Insurance Solutions, which is more or less around uh, developing uh, inclusive financial solutions and de-risking investments for smallholder farmers so that they can become more resilient. Uh, we also have our seeds work, uh, which is where I sit, called Seeds to Be or Seeds to Business. And this is all about improving the availability of seed technologies to the uh, hands of small-scale farmers, but specifically um, to build as re resilience, um, you know, in the face of climate change. And then we also have a research and development arm and uh, also policy, which helps, um, you know, in, in ensuring that there is a clear path for uh, a lot of these innovations to make it to, uh, to the farmers. Next slide. So what's the current landscape, um, smallholder farmer landscape in Africa? I think um, a lot of people um, know this, uh, but there's the good and the bad. Um, the good is that we have well over 30 million smallholder farmers that are contributing to uh, quite a significant amount for the food supply in Africa. Uh, the good news also is the fact that uh, there's quite a lot of land in Africa uh, that's arable, uh, over 65% of that. What's not very good is the fact that uh, we're still a net importer of food and uh, it's only projected to increase. And um, another bad thing is the fact that, you know, out of the land that's available, we're only producing 10% of the wild uh, agricultural output. And most recently, what's even worse is that we're actually importing uh, food um, from countries that are at war, uh, which is not a very good thing. So the challenges are known, uh, they're being addressed, but I think it's good to point those out. Um, lack of information for the smallholder farmers, access to infrastructure, you know, uh, markets uh, to help uh, get the, the produce uh, to where it needs to go, financial solutions, um, uh, you know, to de-risk their investments, mechanization to make them more efficient, uh, and most importantly, and, and that's why it's in red, is really the lack of access uh, to quality inputs. And in this case, uh, seed, which is what I'm going to be addressing um, as we speak. Next slide, please. So what are we doing as seeds to be um, uh, within the Syngenta Foundation? So this slide kind of uh, takes you through this framework that we've been using um, to help us scale out the um, you know, delivery of innovation to small scale farmers. It's a product life cycle. Uh, and it's a, you know it's more or less a stage gate approach from the time uh, technology is conceptualized to the time it actually makes it to market and starts exiting the market and uh, something else replaces it. And as you can see in the funnel, there's a lot of seed innovation that comes in um, um, through the pipeline, but not all of it will actually make it to market, or not all of it will be fit for purpose to make sure that it meets the needs of the farmers or the market. And the bubbles you see there, where it says stage zero problem definition, solution design, and solution delivery, these are the three key areas that we seek to address. Um, before you're even developing a new hybrid or a new uh, seed variety, it has to meet a need uh, in the market. And then you're starting to design that solution when you're breeding for that purpose, right? And then uh, where we come in as seeds to bees on the solution delivery, which is now where the rubber meets the road, and you know, it's, there's a big gap uh, between what you see in, in, in orange to what you see in the green part, which is uh, the material coming in from the research side and making it into the commercial element. There's a gap there. Um, the gap is a bit smaller in the, in, in the, in the private sector, and I come in from the private, private sector uh, as well. And I know David would also agree with me that that gap is, is, is smaller when you come into the private sector. But in the public sector, it's, it's much, much broader. And that's where we want to bridge that gap between uh, those two elements to make sure that <clears throat> what's coming in from the pipeline meets the needs of the farmers, solves their issues, makes them more resilient, uh, makes them more climate smart. And I think that's really where uh, a lot of the attention needs to be, uh, to be made. Next slide. So within that framing of um, that stage five to stage eight that you saw, there are bottlenecks um, that constrain farmers from getting access to these innovations. And I've listed a couple of them here. Um, you know, one is we know, and we always support the fact that the public sector is developing and releasing a lot of uh, new innovations, which is excellent. Uh, but then some of those value propositions may not be well, well known or verified, and so they, get stuck um, in, in the process and don't get to the next level. 
um, also seed companies who are the drivers to make these uh, technologies get to the hands of small scale farmers, they're not able to um, take them up, you know, through, through different licensing approaches that may not be fit for them to be able to do that, or they may not even know that they exist, right? And those seed, same seed companies also encounter a lot of risks because uh, there's different elements of how they understand what the market wants. And so that needs to be solved for because then again, um, a risky business opportunity is not something that a lot of these seed companies will want to get into. Uh, capital uh, is, is, is a big, big, big bottleneck uh, for mostly small and medium sized um, seed companies. We've done a lot of work to support them and I think more needs to be done. Um, the pipeline of the varieties that are coming in or the innovations that are coming in are mostly from the public sector. Um, that information is still not available and we're doing a lot of work to be able to, uh, to make that uh, visible. Um, somebody mentioned about early generation seed supply. That become, that's still a big issue um, with, that constrains uh, the innovation delivery that needs to be addressed. Um, a lot of people agree with the fact that especially these self-propagated uh, crops, um, they don't see a lot of investment because a lot of these seed companies don't think that farmers will come back again uh, to buy a new seed. Regulations need to be fit for purpose. Uh, that is still a bottleneck. Uh, farmer awareness, and I'm glad that uh, my previous uh, presenters have also mentioned um, some of these elements and there are addressable um, you know, elements that are going into, um, into this to resolve for this uh, bottleneck. And the regulatory, the regulatory capacity to make sure that farmers are trusting uh, what's coming in from the formal sector uh, is something that they can invest in. Next slide. So this, this slide just kind of gives you a context of um, the journey that, um, you know, the seed actually takes. By the time, you, you know, you're coming in from the breeder seed to the time you're getting a commercial seed, it's years, right? So everything that has to happen has to happen in a very systematic manner. And you have to also have focused interventions uh, to ensure that you don't have a break in, in the process. If you have a break in the process, then that extends that whole process and that makes sure that it, it, it only exacerbates the issue that farmers are not going to be able to get these innovations. Uh, at so by the time the, the seed that's, you know, has been bred is making commercial seed uh, into distribution, uh, farmers have to be aware of it. Um, they have to also have the ability to have observed the performance because farmers are very visual. They have to trust the source of the seed and they have to also be able to trial the, 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 the variety that, uh, that, uh, that we are presenting to them and also have the ability to be uh, made aware through extension support. So it's a process I think along this, this, this chain are very important. And as I mentioned, any break in this only makes the process much longer, which is not necessarily what we would want to see. Next slide. So what do we need to do to deliver innovation um, uh, at scale? Uh, I think some of these elements have been mentioned, which I, is great because we're all aligned in the approach. Um, building capability uh, within the public sector to address those, some of these gaps that we've identified is important. Um, go to market approaches, um, you know, so that we can have varieties linked to the needs downstream so that varieties or innovation doesn't just sit in shelves, but it makes it downstream to the hands of small scale farmers is important. Um, then building business skills um, that, uh, that, that, that then addresses, and this is more or less on the plant breeding, uh, public plant breeding um, processes to ensure that, um, again, what's the technologies that are coming in are not addressing, just or trying to address all segments, but they have to address very specific segments, um, you know, downstream uh, towards the small scale farmers. Um, and then next would be the linkages um, to the public breeders with SME seed companies who may not have a breeding program so that they can be able to be that conduit for, for the seed or the innovation to actually make it to market. Uh, the next one is really looking at how to facilitate that tech transfer. Uh, and this is more or less formalizing the process. We talk about licensing agreements, uh, which makes sure that there's a formalized approach on how this technology is transferred. And some, some of that money gets back into the breeding cycle to improve the process going forward. Seed companies need, need, need capital, they need technical assistance, technical backstopping to, to help them invest in some of these new 
technology. It could be for mostly marginalized or orphan crops, and we need to help them in order for them to invest in some of those uh, technologies. And also uh, supporting them in seed production, early generation seed production, certified seed production, scaling that is important. And policy at the national and regional level is also a very key element because if a policy doesn't create an enabling environment, then of course, we'll basically be doing injustice to uh, delivering seed innovation to, to more of us. Next slide. So I, I would be remiss if I wouldn't um, talk about some of the successes uh, or at the Sinjana Foundation. And, um, and this is a program that um, uh, has been implemented by ourselves over the last uh, four to five years in five countries uh, with a generous support from the American people through the USAID. Um, and as you can see, we've done a lot of work um, in delivering uh, and facilitating and catalyzing um, a lot of seed production, uh, sales through seed companies, uh, mostly private sector. A lot of farmers uh, have been impacted. A lot of land has also been uh, planted under improved varieties of different crops that we've been supporting. And again, this is mostly for orphaned crops and um, you know that have been uh, supporting farmers to be more resilient. Uh, a lot of um, licensing deals have been signed uh, that we've facilitated. Uh, varieties have been uh, registered. You can see 50 varieties. And we've tested uh, uh, varieties across over 1,500 uh, different sites in, in these different countries. And uh, the photo that you see there is, is, is in Kenya, in, in northern Kenya, where it's primarily a uh, pastoral area. We in, it introduced uh, potato, and as you can see, the, the, the women there are excited about the fact that they can actually now start diversifying um, their investments and getting themselves into crop farming, uh, and not only about pastoralists. So we are really excited about these opportunities, and of course, building on this success and, 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 and looking forward to uh, scaling this up in the next uh, number of years as well. Next slide. So with that success um, and the approach that we've been taking, we've, we want to develop our toolkit or a handbook or a guideline that we can then socialize to the industry to ensure that um, you know, you know, folks, uh, project managers, seed companies, private sector, public sector, can be able to take these learnings that we've had, take, uh, you know, look at the tools that we've been able to develop, utilize those tools. I've seen on, the, on some of the Q&As, somebody asking questions about digital tools to uh, enable um, you know, farmers get access to seed, uh, is what we're developing now. It's been in production now for the last uh, couple of years. We're hoping to have that developed, I mean, uh, launched uh, mid of this year. And uh, obviously this is something that uh, would be very excited to get feedback from a lot of the, uh, the stakeholders in the industry. And it's going to be a global one, so um, a lot of the folks in this in this forum will be able to get access to it. Next slide. So just to give you a, a, a sneak peek of uh, what the, what this toolkit will, will have, and it'll have all these modules that you can see here. Uh, it's, some of them will be addressing, um, you know, if you're in the uh, pro problem definition phase of your variety commercialization or you're in your solution delivery phase, you'll have a tool that you can tap into. Uh, and you can see in the middle one here about market segmentation. I remember uh, David had talked about you know, marketing. Some of those elements will actually be here. So anybody that's looking to understand more around how they go to market will be uh, glad to see that there's gonna be some tools that they can be able to use uh, in this. And this is all gonna be completely free uh, for people to, to be able to use. Next slide, which should be my last slide. Yeah, so this is just my parting thoughts. Um, I think, you know, the commercial seed delivery to small scale farmers, I, I think still remains a big, big challenge. And I think we're trying to solve for this varietal turnover. I saw in the comments here, somebody mentioning about varieties being over 40 years uh, or, or more. I think that's still a problem. I think we need to address a lot of these elements that I've talked about. Uh, but we still need to look at this through a product life cycle because that's that's where you're able to then identify some of these gaps and develop um, solutions that can be able to then help um, you know diversify the range at which mostly public sector 
crop varieties and making it to the hands of small scale farmers. And then we can be able to then improve uh, the varietal turnover uh, through, the, through the private channels. So it's a call to action. I think we're not gonna be able to do this ourselves. I'm glad that Aggie mentioned about the center of excellence and systems within Agra. Uh, we're looking to partner with, with you guys as well. Uh, and of course, anybody else in this forum, I think we will be able to uh, do this as a, as a team uh, and, and build this uh, uh, partnerships to, to be able to deliver uh, innovation at scale and uh, obviously improve the livelihoods of small scale farmers. Over. Thank you so much, Tony. And thank you for, uh, I think you've made a little effort to abbreviate a bit. And so we have about 20 minutes now. Um, I'm going to be asking each of, first of all, three fantastic presentations, tons of questions. So I'm just going to pick a few. Uh, Thomas Van Morick asked, the Integrated Seed Sector Development Initiative has initiated decentralized certification through a process called Quality Declared Seed. I'm sure many have heard of that that addresses the issue of limited capacity at the national and provincial level to certify seeds and the high cost of certifying seed. His question is specifically, I think to you, Aggie, what's Agra's view on QDS? But if you had, can answer very quickly, I'd like for the others to comment as well. And let's turn on our camera. Yeah. yeah. Like I mentioned from our seed start assessment, uh, quality is one of the key areas of assessment and uh, certainly it is key. It remains a very critical node. So the issues of capacity for government's investments are critical. So the key issues we highlight it and then when partners are coming in, they can then be able to invest in it. So models and whatever that are available are welcome, but it is very critical for the success of the seed sector. The quality declared seed. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tony or uh, 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 David. Anything to add? Yeah, I, I think it's a very important one. We can't ignore the fact that um, uh, you know farmers are driving more towards the informal seed sector, and how we can formalize this is what's important. And I think QDS provides that framework, and then helping build capacity for those community-based um, producers will be very important. I don't think it's something we can ignore. Excellent. David, anything to add? No, I think I support what my fellow speakers have said. Okay, great. Um, Mark Ireland asked, what do you advise to reduce and gradually eliminate the sale of counterfeit legume seed on the Zambia market? Seed companies have here identified the main sources of counterfeit seed as agro dealers, marketing agents, and informal cross-border imports. So pretty diffuse set of uh, challenges there. Who would like to take a first stab at that? I, I can take that, Rob. Um, I think it's a very important one. And I've, I've also worked in Zambia and I've, I've seen it firsthand, but it was mostly on maize. Uh, there's a lot of solutions already out there, um, especially around um, this scratch labels um, on certified seed that folks like MP Degree have put out. Uh, that has helped a lot of farmers be able to verify ahead of time. Of course, it costs money but it also gives them the, the, the confidence that what they're buying is, is definitely, um, uh, you know, true certified seed and not kind of thing. Thank you. Anything to add from the others? Yeah, I could quickly add that uh, regulation as well um, and self-regulation. I think the experience we've seen is that self allowing self-regulation as a starting point is critical and also standardizing. Uh, standardizing, you know, the classification. It's very easy, especially for porous borders. Then also certifying the agro dealers, because the agro dealers, if they are not certified, then they can't be tracked. Then they can't be. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's. Yeah. A, <laughs> I'm sure that's a. It's, rich it's a dicey right one, there. but yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I can also add that there has to be a certain level of harsh willingness by the regulators to, to deal with the, with the counterfeit issue. Because if, if we look at the countries where counterfeit uh, is not a big issue, it's where there is a bit of harshness from the regulators. So uh -huh. we, we, that okay. has to come. Mm. So the public sector sounds like has a role to play here. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is very important too, because we definitely, you know, we know Hybrid maize is the tip of the spear in terms of creating the private seed sector, but we so need it to bring along with it these really important legume crops and other crops, oil seeds uh, that, that are so vital. So uh, get, getting these things right is really important. Now, another really important question 
from um, Kate McDonald Polakowicz, and she says, what considerations for creation and adoption of quality seed is focused on building demand and value for female farmer customers? And maybe if you want to add to that question, anything about female seed dealers, I welcome it. Who would yeah, like to give that? Yeah, try that. Yeah, so I think as we, we, we seed marketers really have to pay special interest to the to the female farmers because we we know like for example in our African setup the 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 role the female farmers play they are the backbone of the family so as seed marketers go out there they have to really pay special attention and link the the benefits they are proposing to the farmer and the pain points they really have to know what the pain points of the of the female farmer is and address that with the benefits of the variety. Excellent. Who else would like to add in on this gender issue? Yes, I could come through. Yes, of course, the, the approach to female female farmers, female entrepreneurs, female researchers, female policymakers certainly needs to be more intentional. And um, I think we are been learning and relearning in that area that, for example, in uh, Muslim uh, countries, you wouldn't expect the female uh, farmers to come to, to, to the community centers to learn, for example. So you've got to be able to have the approaches that are tailored to the local laws and regulations, but, but also the culture nuances of each geographical region. So yes, it's critical that we pull them in and where we get them, we're actually finding them to be more trusted and they, they are also trusted by the other parties. So they are one key trust nugget to have in the and system. Maybe and may be trusted by women, I think, especially. Uh, uh, well. I think this issue of women entrepreneurs in the seed industry, particularly not just in the formal side, but very importantly in the informal side, you know, we did that yellow bean work where we looked at the bean movement through the informal seed sector in the highland countries, and it was uh, fantastic. And a lot of that was mediated through women-owned small seed system enterprises. Tony, anything from you on this one? No, just just supporting what uh, what the uh, what my, my co-presenters have actually. Okay, great. Um, so Meta asked, in countries and regions with a lot of development agencies, all the AID people look at ourselves in the mirror. I wonder how donor money either prevents or supports getting farmers to purchase the seeds without subsidies. Is there still a competitive and well-functioning market where producers and marketers have to compete for their customers? I think this is a question about context, and we know there's many different contexts. Who would like to tackle it? Tony, you go ahead. Say okay. whatever you want about donors. <laughs> Tony, go. No, I was going to say that uh, I, I, I support what you said, Robin. It's based on context. I think um, the idea is to help farmers adopt you know, new technologies. And of course, some of these subsidies help farmers adopt. The challenge, of course, becomes at what point are you able to then wean farmers off of the uh, of, off of the subsidy? And are they going to continue um, at the same pace they were, you know, they were on adopting whatever new technologies there were? Um, and so it's, 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 it's how you look at it and how you're able to build a sustainable model for farmers to be able to be weaned off of those uh, those those subsidies in the future, and they can be able to then still produce, I mean, to still procure the the, the, the improved varieties of the new technologies that are there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I could. Oh, go ahead. Come on in. I could quickly. I could quickly add in. Yes, there is a role for um, for donors because they normally put their money where it's hard to reach, where nobody is ready to go. So they get their hands dirty, first entry point. There is a role for subsidies because, you know, you cannot be able to afford these inputs for farmers. But in taking a market systems approach, there has to be a very clear exit point where then private sector gradually comes in. And in our models where we are using consortia, for example, we've got to have a minimum viable size of farmers, about 15,000 farmers aggregated and easily reachable for us to see private sector follow. So I think these models are in tandem and it's, it's a case of watch and see. It's, it's not a, a straight jacket answer. Yes, Thank yes. You. David, anything to add on this one? Yeah, I think I can only give a bit of experience is that if we look at the 
yeah, the donor funding can also be a crippling factor to the farmers' adoption because they keep waiting for the next uh, donor or the next NGO to come. But what I've seen is that uh, the models that, for example, what private sector uh, foundations have, have done, Syngenta Foundation, East West Foundation, is they, they don't provide for free, but they, they do a lot of extension work. So probably that's, that's something that uh, the, the donors would look at orienting the funding to more of education and extension work. Yeah. So on that, these are all great comments. On these points, I would say that there's been a tremendous amount of learning, uh, including in the humanitarian community, uh, about not, you know, doing no harm and not undermining systems. And there lots of innovative approaches have been adopted. I'm not saying we have it perfect yet, but um, I think the, we certainly want to see all our efforts, regardless of who's behind them, to be uh, looking for ways to be sustainably empower local actors, uh, uh, sustainably as economically sustainable in this case, uh, to continue the work. Um, so then, um, um, Frederick Bett asked, and this is about the access issue, is access to credit by smallholder farmers, farmers derailing, or is the absence of it, I guess, derailing the uptake of improved and climate smart crop varieties. And why don't you take this as an opportunity to elaborate a bit on what smart smart interventions and if I use the S word, smart subsidies look like. Any one of you. Okay, I could come first. Um, <clears throat> one is um, our, what we have seen in the areas where we operate, actually smallholder farmers do receive credit, but from agro dealers or hub agro dealers. So as we all know, they are not exactly bankable. So we have, you know, smart options where we de-risk and we've got like an input subsidy whereby they take a percentage, the agro dealer picks a percentage, then the hub agro dealer picks a percentage. So there must be a level of de-risking but 100% getting the smallholder farmers, it is still a long way, a long way to come. And we're seeing that private capital is not following smallholder farmers until, like I mentioned, they reach a certain point where now their business is viable to attract proper uh, commercial capital. But yes, it does derail the adoption. <clears throat> David? Several questions came in about the cost of seeds. So thank you, uh, uh, David or Tony. Yeah, I think I can also around, especially around the de-risking element, um, that's where I think the most issue is because farmers will not want to invest if if they the risk is too high, and I think those de-risking models are there. Um, farmers, yes, they are not bankable, and they still a very this this a lot of these financial institutions are very risk of us, and and as such, we have to build models. And again, it is it going to be sustainable? But I think. The de-risking element is probably what needs to come first, and then, of course, uh, without support, then farmers can then invest more in in, in the new technologies. Okay, uh, David. Yeah, I think I, I can also add that yes, credit is a challenge to the to to the adoption. We've also seen attempts in some seed systems to incorporate uh, microfinancers, who then come and understand the needs of the farmer. And coupled with that, there's crop insurance that's also coming to remove the risks. So when 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 the risk is, is less, then the farmer becomes bankable. So it ha I, I think for me, it's more of a matching this uh, finance and a bit of insurance, if not all. And as critical mass uh, gathers in, in the cr uh, crop insurance, there'll be interesting products that will come and then make the farmer more attractive to the, to the funders. Okay, great. Thank you. All great points. So I'm going to try to synthesize a question here about uh, diversification in these systems, and particularly around vegetables, where we know there's so much interest because of economic income opportunities, food system quality, diets, all, all of the benefits we associate, labor, value addition, etc. cetera. Um, what's the situation like in Africa around vegetable seed? How much of it is still imported, and are we seeing? Are, is it coming up, and is it? How is how is it fitting into the work that you're all doing? And there, uh, Aggie, I, maybe I'll start with you because uh, there was a specific question about Agra promoting. Are they promoting vegetables 
So uh, let's start there, and but I, I think all of you will have insights that we will welcome here. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, we, we're seeing actually an increase in uptake of vegetable seed. And uh, for those of us that have been to the market and have seen the agro dealer shops, they actually it's literally like a 50-50% in the shops. And what is driving this is really the diversification agenda, but also because we are a rain-fed country in most countries, the farmers need to be able to plant more than one. So any profit they get out of one crop, they're able to diversify into something else. It's not just actually vegetables. We're also seeing you know, poultry, we're seeing dairy as a diversification model. Uh, as well, and we promote that um, with, our, with our village based advisors. So that is actually coming up, but still at a very small scale. And maybe David or Tony, you could add it to the points about where the seed is being produced. Oh, yes. Is that changing? Yeah, uh, I think oh, I can oh, add it. Of course. Oh, sorry, sorry, David. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, the public sector has not done so much in in vegetable se sector but I, uh what we've seen is that companies are now paying special interest in africa uh, the breeding may be happening outside but uh, now they're very conscious of what their african farmer needs and there's a lot of interest we are seeing a lot of product testing a lot of deployment of field staff and that is that is filling the gap that uh that 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 has been existing so farmers are getting more and more choice but of course a lot a lot needs to be done Okay. Yeah, I fully agree with what David said, and I think what's most important is that farmers are seeing that as a as a great opportunity for increasing their in, uh, incomes. Uh, it's high value. Uh, what we're seeing as a gap is that knowledge of how to do it, how to access the seedlings themselves. And I think from our perspective, we're trying to build um, the agri agri entrepreneur models that I mentioned earlier around these vegetable um, ecosystems, like what we're doing in West Africa and Senegal. Um, you know, building capacity for people to develop, you know, to 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 propagate seedlings and then in network, then able to provide knowledge links, inputs, and farmer, I mean, and market linkages to those same producers, so that it can become it become a sustainable model for them to to increase their income. But it's it's really really growing, but the breeding is still happening outside of the countries. So just pushing the envelope here. Thank you all for those questions answers. Um, what about Aggie? You mentioned dairy. What about forage seed? Is improved for it? We hear a lot about the the the, the gains being made in things like brachiaria, in terms of climate resilience and such. Any 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 insights on that? Yeah, I think um, as Agar, we've we've uh, we've really been piloting a couple of initiatives. You know, in with Kakamega with. Tree, tree crops with uh, forestry with whatever so I think there is so much awareness that is coming and responding to the climate shocks that not just ourselves but the farmers are also finding ways to remain resilient and I think that is the interesting trend that we are continuing to see so continuing these conversations and fixing the extension system so that the information is going on time but is also responding to a market in our view remains the key bottleneck but in terms of response we're seeing a couple of projects that are diversifying into tree crops into agroforestry into all of these conversations that are ensuring that we are you know treating for the moisture and ensuring the soil content you know is 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 the right fit thank you i love it because it's farmer choice farmer yeah, choice yes. and it's demand driven yeah. hey um there's um one other thing that I wanted to just ask you about, ah, it was a question on the, the list here. We heard about the counterfeit. Tony, you mentioned that in Zambia, the, 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 the digital. What other digital innovations are coming in and making a difference very quickly? Just off the top of your head, let's start with uh, David. Yeah, I think there are new ways of reaching the farmers, for example, Instagram, WhatsApp, the, 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 the digital marketing, it's, it's actually, uh, an alternative and that's why we've taken up upon us to test the effectiveness so that we're able to to tell the audience that yes this this works more than the these others for 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 the other audience so yes that's that's what i can say thank you david tony uh you on this one and then also the, uh your uh, your audience wants to know when the toolkit will be publicly available so if you could speak to that as well we're just about out of time so 30 seconds and 30 seconds and then we'll end yeah, there's definitely a lot of tools. Uh, one of them that uh, we, we've also developed is to help uh, farmers um, understand their, 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 their farming practices, uh, more or less 
how to build their businesses and how to you know keep an inventory of what they buy and what they sell so that they can become bankable in future um, as far as the tool goes it will be publicly available it will be just be a login um, and then you'll have to you know you have access to the entire platform once it's launched thank you wonderful and any last word to you Okay, so probably I'll speak to the public sector one. I think we are seeing a bundling of smart subsidies where farmers are registered through a pub, through you know registration on digital. They can only access uh, the the money for the inputs through the bank, and we're seeing that in Rwanda, and then they are validated through their local village uh, administration. Scratch cards are the other on private sector whereby if if your card is scratched, you can be able to take a QR code check and check whether it's a, a, it's the right thing or a counterfeit. So there's developments coming, but still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we're all very excited to see these little leapfrogs that end up being big, big steps forward for the whole system. And I think that's what came through to me today. How much this is a system? Every link matters. Yes. And, and we need to be very strategic about ensuring strength all around. And that includes our partner countries working with us. I think that was a clear message. Um, okay, I think we're past time. Shall I turn it back to Michael or do you want me to just take us out? You can take us out. Thank you everyone for joining. This was wonderful. Fantastic panel. Really, this is a, a real keeper as many AgriLinks presentations are. So appreciate all three of you coming today and keep up the good work. And we've got a whole, we had a couple hundred people on the line here who were hanging on every word. So thank you again. And uh, we'll hope to see you again soon uh, for, for more on progress in this critical space. Bye everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.